We're sitting out today at the production facility at Bassendine. Uh, you'll see the barrel rooms behind us on Mike's Beer Club and we're lucky enough to be sitting with two stalwarts of the industry as far as WA Brewing and, and absolute legends go. Uh, Brendan Barris from Feral Brewing and John Starwood from Nail Brewing. How are you doing, gentlemen? Going well, Mike. Great, thanks. And thanks. thanks for dropping in on us. Thank you very much for taking the time. It's, it's Friday afternoon drink time, so it probably doesn't work out too badly for schedules. And Tusk Day, you're biting into our Tusk Day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I mean, we were lucky enough to, to catch um, Brendan on, on the run for your biannual release of, of Tusk, which is out today. Uh, it's an Imperial IPA and um, a, a bit of a, a beastly beer that you've gotten out into a few select venues around the country. That's, that happens, that's happened for a couple of years now, right? Uh, yeah, we revived it. We first made Tusk, which, you know, it was between, I think, whether it be Tusk or, or Murray's um, The Wild Thing or Beast or... Back in 2003, the pair of us made, made an Imperial and IPA and, and certainly, I don't, I don't think after that there was a big long gap before it was, it was anyone else that attempted it. We put it into retirement three or four years ago. We bought it back out and now it's a twice a year thing. Um, reason it's twice a year a lot of people ask why do you do that when it when it sells out in an afternoon couldn't you sell it all day every day it's more about keeping the integrity of that beer and that that and how we think that beer style should be um so double ipa the ultimate in in freshness is required you know um as soon as those american hops start to fall over and they start to taste a little bit like a barley wine that that beer is no longer a double ipa and it's not in our mind what the ultimate expression of hops is so build up a little bit of hype get people to appreciate it for what it is, when it is, and it's gone before it gets to go that way. And, and we really feel we're staying true to what we want that style to taste like. It's a, a release that reminds you of some of the, the Pliny the Elder lineups in the US. And uh, <laughs> that, that, that kind of buy on your release, it generates a bit of hype though. And, and, and I guess that's, that's true for, for now with, with your seasonal brews, John. It's just, um, you can generate that kind of hype around a seasonal release when it's, when it's good stuff. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I'd say, look, quality beers, they, they make their own hype. Um, the Pliny comparisons are a bit of a stretch. I mean, make Pliny and, and the street of Santa Rosa has got rows down at, you know, for a whole month every day outside that brew pub, and we're a far stretch from that, and even the amount of beers are a far smaller amount of beer. But, um, yeah, I think well-made beers from, from breweries that people trust will in and of themselves create hype, and... Um, you have to deserve that. Uh, you have to work hard for that, um, and it's certainly and it's something that we appreciate and, and don't take for granted. The fact that people look for it, look forward to some of our special release beers. Yep. I wanted to jump back to the relationship between you guys. Um, there's a whole lot of shared awards uh, and collaborations oh, no, between we, Nail and Ferrell. We don't share awards. <laughs> Well, se separate, se separate cabinets, maybe, uh, yeah, but uh, cabinets. you've won them on the same evening, let's just say that. So probably go, go back to the beginnings of the, re the relationship between uh, John, yourself and Brendan, which is a decade long, right? Yeah, we've uh, known each other for a long time, back in uh, 1999 when uh, Nail was getting set up. At, uh, Brendan set it up at uh, Bobby Dazzler's. So we became friends and uh, over that long period, uh, we uh, became best friends and had now and Feral got the same goals, so we eventually uh, started Brew Corp back in 2012. But we're we competitive against each other, but uh, we're still, you know, uh, fighting the same battle. Yep. Yep. And, and so, so that that relationship's extended to where we're sitting now, which is um, a, a separate facility to what people are used to when they um, head to, to the Basso to drink nail spears or they head out to the Swan Valley. Um, you guys have set up a, a dedicated production facility here, which is, hasn't been open too long, right? Yeah, so we uh, Brew Court started in 2012, 2012 at Freo 1 Collier Road in Bassendine. Uh, last year we moved it to 323 Collier Road and it's just a production facility, it's not open to the public. Uh, Brendan did a great job because uh, he was the project manager to move the brewery, but it's like a lot of people setting up breweries takes a long time, but uh, managed to move the whole brewing kit and keep operations flowing. 
uh, keep beer flowing, and it was, uh, uh, you know, great credit there. This place is, is built to scale, so you, it's 20, 2017, but you, you guys are looking f ahead with this kind of setup, with especially with your, your canning bottling and, and the space on the floor, that, or the subfloor that we've, we've got in front of us, right? Yeah, I think it's fair to say we learn our lesson. Um, and uprooting and shifting a brewery, it's, um, I don't think anyone likes moving house. Uprooting your, your beer business and your brewery is, is, I think, 10 times worse than moving house. So. And, and probably as well more expensive than moving house. So we certainly made sure that um, there was enough space and everything was sized so that all the pieces of the puzzle were going to be at capacity at the same time. So there was not even a thought going to come into our head of, of uprooting and doing it all again. Day to day, how, do, how does a relationship work? Are you kind of, do you throw cans of VPA up the stairs to Brendan, John, and, and Brendan throws cans of Warhog back to you? Or, or how, I mean, how does the kind of interaction work um, from a, I guess, a friendship level and, and operationally? Uh, I'm outnumbered and a bit picked on here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I've been not saying anything bad or, <laughs> but uh, no, we um, we get on good. We uh, We have kind of, continuous meetings but they're all informal and just uh there's running a brewery there's always problems and it's just uh we've just got our uh friendship and uh good team that you know solves problems and keeps things moving forward yeah i'd say broadly it's you know the old one one dream one team kind of thing um people always say is there a partnership agreement a contract agreement you know John and I just have a handshake and when we don't agree on something we'll just sit and talk about it and when he get if he doesn't get his way he'll throw something at me um, never happens we don't actually ever get to that um, it's quite simply we're in it we're in it for the same reason got the same goals and what do we need to do to, to, to solve a situation it's never come to a crossword and uh, I don't don't think we uh, foresee that that happening yeah we've never had a business we've never ever had a business problem at all that we've kind of uh been annoyed with each other for the only problem we had was a minor one to do with industry stuff that was not related to even the the business so and that so we 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 uh easy it's only really yeah. john's bad jokes get a bit annoying <laughs> and that kind of thing <laughs> right <laughs> You just turn off the intercom, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, so the the other thing about producing at um, scale is that you've got uh, you've got kind of an interesting flexibility here with like barrel projects, Brendan. I, I was kind of surprised to walk into the production facility here and just see a wall of barrels, whereas you kind of expect uh, things like pilots and, and barrel projects to be sitting out at Swan Valley. So is that is that just a it's, a, it's just practicalities. You, you just want to maintain some, some fun out here at, at this facility as well? Yeah, a bit of both. Um, certainly the bulk of our, our barrel program is in the Swan Valley. For now, we've got some space here, um, and so we thought we'll use it. Um, some barrels became available. We thought we'll grab them. We know we can make a beer to go in them. They're, they're bourbon barrels from Heaven Hill um, that have got an imperial brown ale in them. Um, we've got the space for now, so we could in two three years time if we're too busy and there's stainless steel here then we'll find a spot to do the same thing in the valley but certainly good to share it between the brewing team in the in the brew pub and uh, who get to play with all the barrel fun stuff bugs and that type of thing and the guys who perhaps have to grind a bit more here um, great for them to get a chance to muck around and do some of the fun weird and wonderful things yeah, cool. so the imperial brown sitting in barrels now and that will be in there for how long uh, we would expect until kind of October, November, um, that will be long enough to pick up the flavour or the character from the barrel. So, so using bourbon barrels is all about the, the previous flavour extraction as opposed to, to oak or bacteria. Um, we would expect that to be plenty long enough. Uh, so, so yeah, it might seem strange to do a strong dark beer and release it before Christmas but we kind of have a knack of not getting those things quite right but right. That, that's about when it'll be ready. Yeah. Something that's probably um, not as interesting as barrels but it's probably still to, uh, an important point to make and that's on both kind of judging uh, and industry bodies and industry representing and uh, in December you were made head judge of the, the AIBA beer awards yep. Brendan so yeah that, that, that kind of stuff is is pretty 
uh, clearly important, right, to get out, get out, do some industry representation, and uh, also be part of uh, Wob Wobbler as well and um, other industry bodies. Yeah. yeah. Look, the AIBA is an important event, a very important event on the annual beer calendar. Um, there are plenty of people qualified and capable of doing it. Um, the tricky part is you can't enter your beer uh, whilst you're the head judge and so that's when lots of hands stay in pockets because it is such an important um, thing to be a part of. We kind of, I kind of thought it was about time we did a turn. Um, we've had some great success there and enjoyed success there over the years. Sometimes you just have to put your hand up and say it's our turn. That There are a group of people qualified. Uh, I'll do a stint for a couple of years. It's certainly not a, a career-long thing and I don't see myself putting my hand up to do another stint, not because I don't think I'll enjoy it or wouldn't want to. It'll be time for Feral to be able to throw its hat back in the ring in a couple of years' time. But, it, you know, I think it was just it was appropriate in the right time to, to stand up and do a little bit for the industry and, and take on that role. It's a big part, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with being in, in brewing and WA in general, just being part of that um, community that gives back and collaborates and talks to your neighbour and go, go to the pub together on Friday nights. And yeah, look, the, the, it is a very altruistic still, as it gets more mature, uh, industry. Um, when there was only a handful of us, it was you know certainly very much five buddies all working for the same thing and we'd share everything and and, that, and even now there's you know lord knows how many breweries in wa 30 40 50 who knows 53 53 Four, five, um it's there's still very few people that you don't know right. um there's still v no one that you wouldn't help if they ask and who wouldn't help you back if you needed some so it's still a fantastic industry to be in um it's really about people that are doing it because it's something that they want to do and they love to do as opposed to seeing a way for a quick buck because I promise you there's far easier ways to make a quick buck um, and, and I think once you've been in it for a while you realise that and, and the long term is certainly um, are in it because of the comradeship that's not just within their own business and their own team but across the, the businesses and breweries. Yeah. It's a, a revered position to be in. I'm, I'm not sure quite how to angle this, but every, every brewery we've, we've, we've visited, name um, yourself, John, and, and Brendan, as two, two people in the industry that uh, you follow, you've been mentored, uh, sorry, that they've been, follow, that they've been following, they've been mentored by. Um, it's, it's kind of like the top, at the top of the mountain is feral and uh, nails there and all the other kind of young guys starting breweries in Bustleton now are uh, just continually continually look to um, to you guys so not to kind of blow trumpets or anything we're the oldest. <laughs> yep. yeah we're the oldest and look that's very humbling because equally um, yep we've well, I certainly would like to think that I've helped lots of people along their journey but I've had plenty of people help me along my journey too so I you know it's, it's, it's great to hear that we've, we've been helpful or that, that something that we've done might have provided some inspiration, but, but trust me, not every single thing that we've done have we learn off our own back or is it an absolute original idea in our own head. We've pulled inspiration and got help from other people too. So, um, yeah. It's a, it's a huge credit though, it's, a, it's just amazing to hear and the number of times we've tagged Feral Brewing, we've tagged Nail, we've tagged people like Ken and Roger, you know, just, just veterans of the industry. And, so they're the yeah. kind of people again who help, you know, if you talk about who it was, it was Roger Bustle who I was lucky enough the first time I had to go and make a commercial beer, I had someone like Roger Bustle there watching me and talking me through it and making sure it went well and, and there's small tiny little lessons now that, that when I'm training someone this week I've trained a new brewer uh, and there are certain things that Roger told me on my first couple of days that I still repeat uh, and, and ring true now so you know it kind of just gets handed down the line. What about things I've taught you? <laughs> <laughs> Where have they gone? Yeah. Mm. Does, does, that mirror, does that mirror your experience John starting out in the industry? Yeah so um, I guess uh, we know and Feral start at the same time so people like Roger Bustle and uh, Hugh Dunn's helped me a lot. Uh, they've you know, a lot of people helped us at the beginning, and um, and we're good friends with them today. Yeah, so it, it's part of the industry, especially in the early days, and s still continues today. Just, just go back quickly to some of the egging on that you guys. Are, it's possible for you guys to do with each other's beers, right? Zach, can you kind of 
egg, egg each other on as you develop beer styles and just compare notes and get that kind of uh, conversation going? We do egg each other on. It's more spontaneous. We'll battle to I know I love to egg on John on now, but it might not happen. Um, <laughs> Not necessarily on beer, so you know when it comes to putting together a beer, that's actually quite serious business. Right. Um, I guess we don't really brew the same beer. To, we don't try to com- produce the same beer what, style too much, but well, they well, always it was, overlap. Yeah, but it was a conversation that was had, I guess, before we started. Was look, what kind of beers are you making now? Okay. What kind of beers are we making now? There's not that much overlap. We're not going to be fighting for the same tap as such if they want this type of beer now. We were aware that as, as we added to our range, there was going to be some bit more closeness, but um, it was a conversation that was had that, you know, we, you know, we're not going to do exactly what you do. We're not going to do a VPA, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> um, because, you know, if that's kind of a space that John's carved out and John's not going to be doing something that mimics a hop hog necessarily straight either. So, yeah, look, there's a, just a, I guess, a healthy respect there that we just give each other space. There's hundreds of different beer styles. There's really no need for us to go and tramp on top of the same one. So, uh, turning to some of the guys that you're looking towards, I know even developing Hop Hog, you, you took a fair few trips over to the US to, to bring something back that you thought might work, Brendan. So, um, fast forward to today, you've got Hop Hogs established, more than established. What where, where do you go to next? Where do you, where do you kind of look to? Are you, st- are you still taking those overseas trips? And if you are, or if it, even if it's an Instagram feed, who are you, who are you kind of clocking at the moment as, as doing great stuff? Yeah, I'm not a huge social media, so it doesn't come so much from that. But um, so what are we working on now? Right now, we started making lager again, our Perth local, uh, in November last year. Um, and that's been a challenge for us we haven't made lager for six or seven years before that uh before that and and so that's a challenge it was deliberately a challenge for the guys to to change the mindset it's totally a different beer to make and so that came from camden uh, and and visiting camden um brewery in london and tasting their range of lagers they had three or four lagers all of which were fantastic um and sorry there's no head nod to the german when we're talking about lager that the, they were just really really nice and and as a brewery that was set up to make ale they were doing a great job of making lager and so we came back from them to make that challenge and we still got a you know, we're, we're happy with our lager are we ultimately satisfied no we've got a couple of percent extra we want to pull out of that still um so, so that was one otherwise i think we've probably just grown into our pants a bit and we can kind of um decorate our own room and um pick our own clothes and do our own thing a bit a bit more now we're probably not looking uh, as much to others as, as we were when we were three, four, five, six years old as a brewery. Um, yeah, we, we probably reckon we've got a feel for where we want to go and what we want to do a bit better ourselves. Perth, Perth locals joined the canning lineup uh, along with Sly Fox and Warhog, which we've got a can of now. So, what's, um, what's next as far, as far as kind of packaging distribution? What, what are you looking at for 2017? Yeah, we reckon we've got enough permanent, permanent SKUs, which is the industry term for permanent products. Um, we're still settling in a little bit to, to the new brewery one. We're getting more and more comfortable by the day with it and, and, and with the beer that we get out of it and then we can get it out in a timely manner. So once that's done, we'd like to ramp up just our brew pub releases generally. Is there a set um, program or list of those that we've, we've agreed on? No, but we make over 30 different beers out in the Swan Valley every year. So it'll just be which way is the wind blowing at any given time and we'll pull one of those and we'll do it in here and do a one-off release of that. So to, just to ramp that up and make that more regular is going to be probably our our plan over the next 12 months from now um, as far as feral goes and for nail, uh, John, John and I has got a few plans. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess in the last uh, 12 months we've been moving and just concentrating on the core range so now we're doing some specialty batches just in keg only like Clayton Brew it's coming out this week, and uh, which is like a Russian uh, imperial stout porter. Uh, we've got uh, we did the cactus Kolsch, which has hit the market a couple of weeks ago. We've got uh, flaming Lamington uh, in tank at the moment, which we br- brewed a couple of years ago, which is now an annual beer. So we just uh, haven't done some specialties for a while, uh, and the good ones that were big hits a couple of years ago that we did, uh, we're just getting them back in the market as a single batch. Mm. 
Busy schedules pretty much all around for the for the year, right? You've got a, more more than you can chew in a way of just getting, especially with the new home, just getting things bedded in and. Yeah, look, there's plenty. There's there's plenty on. There's new SKUs, but then look, craft beer is growing at a rapid rate in Australia, and we'd like to hope that we we at least keep pace with the rate that the industry is growing in Australia, grow at that same rate. So that just means we're going to be busier this year than last, as simple as that. Yep. So yeah, it's certainly um, no time to, not too much time to sit back and do this. <laughs> always time for that. <laughs> <laughs> good, good to hear. Um, so uh, I usually try and bookend interviews by asking what's in your beer fridge at the moment. It's just, uh, you can go shelf by shelf if you want, but John, I thought, thought I'd start off with you when you, when you are or are not drinking nail. Um, so I, I obviously drink a lot of nail uh, and we've got a big fridge full of uh, the nail variety. Uh, then, so I probably drink 80% of my beers I drink a nail, which I enjoy. Next 15% is feral, which is uh, I also enjoy. And then, so I only leaves 5%, uh, <laughs> which isn't much, I guess, but uh, to, to uh, that, uh, you know, testing new beer I see from other, uh, other breweries. But uh, I am lucky to have a uh, big fridge outside my office that's f uh, full of nail and feral beers, and it's uh, very lucky. What am I drinking? I'm drinking, I am drinking a fair bit of VPA when I'm not drinking our own beer. Um, outside of that, we've been able to get some beer across from some friends at Ben Spoke. Um, so some of their cans have been delicious. And also our friends over at Bolter, I'm kind of really loving uh, their XPA is, is um, spending a fair bit of time in my fridge at the moment as well. Yeah. Some of the, the Bolter guys aren't aren't uh, aren't canning things like the grapefruit IPA at the moment, but they're you know they're, that's they're going great great guns. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, gentlemen, you've got still things to do on a Friday afternoon, and I really appreciate your time today. It's been an absolute privilege coming out today. So thank you very much, John and Brendan. Cheers. Thanks, thank Mike. Great thank having you. you.